Okay. For those who are still behind, I am not going to feel jealous if you continue eating or drinking. I have my drink over here for now, so that's good. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for coming out over here on this evening. Uh, I understand things close pretty early in New Zealand, Australia. Back in India, we are getting close to tea time right now. So really happy to see you all here. Thank you for coming again. And let's get started with the topic. And uh, as some of you who know me, Ashwini in particular, I can keep talking a lot. So if you get bored, I can't see you, you're getting bored. Okay? So you have to tell me, okay, that's enough and we'll stop. Today, what we are going to talk about is two topics. Uh, one is about visual validation, why it is important, what is it, why is it important, and how can it really help you get better in certain aspects of your testing. The second is, how do you scale your automation from the traditional cross-browser testing approach, and how can you bring the power of AI in that execution itself to get faster feedback? So these two are the primary topics. But again, we can talk about a lot of other things based on what your interest areas also are. Of course, related to testing. That's what I do. Okay. Uh, little information about me. I'm a solution architect, quality evangelist with Happy Tools. I also contribute uh, to open source. I'm a Selenium and Atium contributor. I do a lot of other open source work as well. I try to use sharing my experience as an excuse to go and learn from other people. So this is a great opportunity to learn from you. So it's up to you to make this a learning experience for me to interact and ask a lot of questions. Okay, reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, email, uh, either way, even after this uh, session, and we can continue the conversation forward. So that's enough about me. I want to start off with, um, principle that I hope everyone is very well aware of. Who does not know about the test automation pyramid? That's one. Anyone else? Okay, there are a few people. Okay, oh, that's cool. From those who know, you want to explain it? Anyone wants to take a step? What is the automation pyramid? Or what is the testing pyramid? Anyone? No? Okay, I guess you're busy finishing the pizza or the drink. I'll explain. Uh, the automation pyramid is actually a very simple concept. It tells you what are the different types of automated tests you can write for your application so that when any change happens in the application, you run those tests and you get feedback on what is the quality of your application. Very simple concept, right? Now, in the simplest of terms, there are three types of tests that we can automate. Unit tests, API tests, and the end-to-end -end tests, the UI tests. That are. But that itself can be very complex based on the complexity of your application because we don't bring, we don't build simple, small monoliths anymore. Do we? we like complex software. And it's complex for a reason, of course. We don't like building complex, but it's complex for a reason. So based on the tech stack of your application, you might need many different types of additional tests as well to know if your product is working well. The core concept still remains the same. And this is where you now need to strain your eyes and get binocular vision because that's not going to be clear sitting from back there. But the left hand side diagram, that talks about the different types of tests you can have in your application. At the lowest point, at the bottom layer of the pyramid is your unit test. And unit tests can be for your backend application, even for your front end. If you're having the JavaScript UI, you are going to have unit tests for your JavaScript code, right? So there are unit tests at the bottom of the pyramid. On top of that, there are the component tests. Component tests can be there as API components or as UI components. You can have automated tests for those as well. And because these are based on API interactions, even the UI component is going to communicate using an API with the backend. You are going to have some contracts in place. So there's a concept of contract testing that comes into picture. That contract testing can also have producer side tests, consumer side tests. Now you see how it's starting to get complicated, right? And then on top, 
you have your UI test, and typically your UI test at this point, because your UI component tests are already taken care of, these are mostly your end-to-end -end tests that you have implemented. These are your scenarios, typically focused on what the users, how they are going to use your application. You've identified those, you've prioritized those, you've automated those, and that is your end-to-end -end UI test that you've automated on top of the pyramid. Now, why a pyramid? That has a big significance. A pyramid, by nature, is wide at the base. You want to have maximum number of tests at the base of your pyramid, that is your unit test. You want to have maximum unit tests. As you go up the pyramid, you want to have less and less number of tests automated. So at this point, it would seem like the UI or end-to-end -end test should be the minimum number of tests automated. In general, think about it that if there are 100 tests automated, Around 1% of your test will be at the top, 99% will be at the bottom, whatever is left is in the, in the middle. Sorry, that's not correct math. But you get the point. You want to have as few tests at the top as possible because that is going to give you the fastest feedback. Or rather, it's going to tell you the feedback from your end user perspective. The fastest feedback is going to come from the uh, test at the bottom of the pyramid. It's not just about the number of tests. The speed of execution makes a lot of difference. The unit test can run fast on the developer machine itself. You don't need an environment to be built and deployed with test data available to be able to run those tests. That's why the UI tests become very expensive. It's not just about the test being slow. It has a lot of cost impact as well in order to build the environment, deploy it into, uh, make it available for testing with the data setup. There's a lot of work required to validate those scenarios. Okay, so that's what the pyramid is. In addition, there are different additional types of tests that can be automated. Security, performance, accessibility, any other types of NFRs that are important as per the context of your product. You would want to automate those as well. The performance test can be automated at any different layer of the pyramid, depending on what is the intent of the test. That is what matters. So performance test can be from the top of the pyramid, as an end-to-end test, load test that you're generating, but you can also have performance tests for core algorithms or implementations that you have in your code, which is going to be used indirectly, but it's a very high performing, uh, high value uh, implementation that you have, right? You want to make sure it is performant as well. Likewise for security. So depending on your implementation, you would see where best can you automate it and get the feedback. You do all this automation, there is one aspect that still remains. That is the aspect of non-automated testing. What we typically end up calling as manual testing. Now, in my opinion, manual testing is bad. Why? Because, yes, you think about scenarios, you think about test cases, but there is no value in having to repeat the same test every time a new build has you know, to be released. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your efforts over it. You're not using your mind to the potential where it needs to be. So if the test is important, find the correct layer at which it can be automated. The lower, the better. Get it automated. Once it is automated, whatever is remaining, because it cannot be automated, it is not feasible for automation, the cost value analysis doesn't justify automating that test. That remains as a conscious choice to be executed manually at defined frequencies. But the important aspect is you also now need to focus on because everything is automated, is there anything else I could test? And that's where the tester mindset comes into picture about risk-based exploratory testing. That is very important to be done. So if you are stuck doing manual testing, you have to relook at that approach and see is that going to be justified? Is that going to add value or not to yourself and to your team? So this is the automation pyramid. Okay. Now we've done all the automation. Now we are going to focus on top of the pyramid. The rest of the conversation is based on top of the pyramid automation for that. Before I say anything more, let me try and do a quick demo. How many testers over here? Everyone focused on automation as well or just 
Okay, a lot of people doing automation. Developers as well? I know there's few for sure. Excellent, great. Sorry if I'm gonna come down heavily on you developers. I'm a tester by heart, by the way. Okay. And of course, this is not the book work here. What the test that I'm running is not very valuable. Don't worry about the code that is going to, uh, the test that is going to actually run for the code that is written for it. It's a simple Selenium Java based implementation. The browser opened over here. So it is going to some website, such an e-commerce website, clicking through it and implementing that scenario, right? Search a product, add the product to cart type of scenario. And the test seems to be going fine. I actually ran it with some incorrect parameters. That's why it took a longer time, but no worries. The test passed. As you can see, the green status at the bottom says the test was successful. Okay. For those who can't read, trust me. Now, Our friendly developers have given us a new build for testing. A new feature has been implemented and they've given us that for testing. Okay, test this out. There's been no major change, some backend optimization or whatever they might have done, some new features implemented, which is unrelated to this test. Okay, and this test should, I'm pretty sure it has failed. Has it failed? Yes, it has. Can someone who does automation come and try and read the message and see why, what is the reason of failure? Anyone? You can come in. Anyone can come in. What is the reason for failure? Not able to locate the element. Okay. How many times do we see such elements? The test failing because locators have changed. Why has this happened? That's a good question to ask the developers. Right? But this is a real problem. But if you think about it, the application has not changed. The functionality is working absolutely fine. If you inspect it manually, Everything is fine. And unfortunately, that's how we proceed with our testing and releases as well, right? Test failed because element changed. Someone manually tested it, certified the build, proceed go to do the release. In parallel, we'll update the test, update the locators, and fix the test. A very sad way to proceed with the implementation because automation has not added value over here. You needed to rely on someone to manually inspect the same functionality, which has already been automated. But it's a real problem, okay? Now, is there a better way to manage this? As soon as I can find my mouse, I will answer that. Okay, so now I'm going to run another test. Okay. In this case, you will not see the browser open up because the way I'm running the test is different. This test is not running on my machine. It's just triggered from my machine, but the actual execution is happening somewhere else. That somewhere else is the Applitools Execution Cloud. You could think of it like any other browser cloud-based solution, right? Where the test is going to run. That's why you don't see the test running over here. But there is a big difference compared to any other solution and what is happening in the execution cloud. The first difference is And I need to move this as well.
Okay. So the first difference is when the test has started running. Oh, this is already fast. That's really fast. I ran the test on one browser, but I'm seeing the results of seven different browsers over here. I was running the test only on one browser. That's what we saw happen locally, right? The second thing is I ran the test on the new build, but on the new build, we saw it fail because of a locator change. But in the execution cloud, it passed. So there are two things that have happened over here. One, instead of one browser, I'm seeing the results from seven. Instead of the test failing, I'm seeing it pass for the same build, the same test. I have not done any other code change. But I'm still seeing that. What is happening over here? So on the execution cloud, there is self-healing capabilities, which means you're trying to interact with the locator. You don't find that locator. And because it's Tools, which is running the test for you, it figures out, okay, the locator is not found. It is trying to self-heal and see if there's any other locator that could be there that actually meets the criteria what the test is trying to do. In this case, it found another locator, which it was able to use and proceed with the execution. And how do I know that? You see this magic wand over here. Again, trust me, if you cannot see it, trust me, it's a magic wand. You click on it, you will see what was the locator originally and what was the locator used to run the test when self-healing was used. So using a different locator, the test was able to proceed and you're able to get the implementation done. The second thing is using the ultra fast grid, we are scaling the execution automatically. Now, what does that mean? What is a typical cross-browser testing strategy? For those who have done cross-browser testing, please speak up. What is cross-browser testing? Sorry? Testing on different browser, right? So running the same set of tests on different browsers, correct? So if I have 100 tests, I've got seven browsers over here. I'm going to run 700 tests to get that kind of feedback. If 100 tests take one hour to execute, 700 tests take at least seven hours to execute. Why at least? Because there's going to be some flakiness, some network issue or something that happens. Tests can fail randomly. You have to look at those results, rerun those failing tests again. So it's at least seven hours of execution. Is that math correct? Overall execution time is still that much though? You still need seven hours of execution time? Yeah. It's like saying, yeah, I'm just going to add more people and reduce the time for testing. Does that really work? After a certain point, it doesn't, right? But the efforts required are still n number of times that is required. So it's seven hours worth of execution. And that is important because you need to have test data for that. You need to have your environment supporting that type of load as well. You need to maintain that type of infrastructure as well, the different browser versions and so on. A lot of complexities and challenges. Manageable because we've been doing it for more than a decade or two or three for that matter. That's the approach that we take. But if you think about it, unless you are building browser specific components, which I really, really hope we, after IE11, we have stopped doing that. Does anyone still build browser specific components? Developers? No, right? Why? Because we assume browsers are W3C compliant. If it works on one, it should work on the other. The libraries that we use support all the browsers. So if functionality works on one, it will work on the others as well. Fair assumption, right? If that is the case, then why do we have to repeat our functional testing on each and every browser again? Can there be a better way to do that? Instead of seven hours of execution, can I get the same feedback in the same one hour? Or maybe a little bit more. That's what the ultra fast grid does for us. What this means is, when you run the test, you're going to configure your test to say which different browsers you want for a validation. And whenever you are using tools for your functional and visual validation, it is automatically going to re-render the same screen on all the browsers. What does re-render mean? Simplistic term. We use Netflix or Prime Video or some OTT application. 
we download videos so that we can play it back in airplane mode, for example, when we are traveling. Similar concept. AppliTools is going to capture that same page, DOM, CSS, and re-render the same page in an offline mode on different browsers that you have configured. And then you are going to simply do the validation on top of it. That means I'm not running my test seven times. Just the screens are getting compared uh, seven times. I don't need seven times test data. I don't need my test environment to support seven times the load. I don't need to maintain the you know, infrastructure for that as well. I'm getting all that validation. The only caveat is instead of one hour, it might take an hour five minutes, an hour 10 minutes. But I think we can live with five, 10 minutes more of execution time, right? It's still a huge saving compared to seven hours of execution time. That is what Ultra Fast Grid is giving us. And then, of course, to add more value to this, what really happens in this execution? In this particular case, I have three different validations that I have done for the screen. It is going to compare the full screen or snippets of the page the way I want it because I understand as an implementer what is important for validation. It is going to compare that using AI algorithms. Is there any difference in the baseline, which is on the left, with what is captured in the new build that I'm testing on on the right hand side? And using AI algorithms, it is comparing and telling me if there's any mismatch found or not. Okay. So that's the third value add that you get just by running it on Aptitude's Execution Club. Now, I'm a big skeptic of self healing. To be very honest, I never like self healing. Why? Because what if I have healed the locator, but the location has changed completely? Functionality works, but it's not usable because the button might have moved from left to the right or whatever else that might happen, right? So I never liked self healing solutions till this point. Why? Because I'm not just self healing, I'm also doing a visual comparison of the screen. So even if functionality is working, but UI is broken, I will get to know from this. The location has changed. Functionality continues to work fine, but this is not what I expected. So I still get that kind of feedback. So as a tester, I feel confident that self-healing will proceed with functional testing, but the visual comparison will tell me, even though functionality is working, is there anything broken from a user experience side of it? That's where the value of self-healing with visual comes into picture. Okay. This is visual testing. This is AI powered cross browser testing. Any questions? Yes. Absolutely. Question is if you first need to have a snapshot at the baseline to do the comparison, how do you do that? Just because of that question, we'll extend the conversation. Others, I was going to go and get a video. That's not me or the Seems like that, right? Seems like that. Can everyone hear me okay like this? Better that way. No. But this is fine. If everyone can hear me okay, then I can just speak like this. Okay. Okay. I'm going to just change one setting on my laptop. Let's just. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. It's, it's, yeah, that's okay. Okay. So let's deep dive into what this really means. And how does visual validation work? How do you get that first baseline also in? And we'll cover that as part of a story. So we saw the test working, the test failing, and it also self-healing and uh, passing while scaling as well. But you do all of this for a particular reason. Why do you do this? It's not just because locators are changing. This doesn't seem to be a good solution just because locators change and my tests fail. You're doing it for a bigger reason than that. Assume you're not doing any of this. You're not using AppliTools Execution Cloud with self-healing. 
you are still doing a lot of your automation based on the pyramid that we spoke about, but bugs escape to production. And it is going to happen because we are building software. Software is going to have bugs. The question is, could you have avoided most of those issues that go out to production? How can you do that? If you think about it, why these bugs escape that could have been caught, the biggest reason is because our approach to testing is incorrect. We have moved from waterfall to agile. I hope we have, right? We have moved from waterfall to agile, but we are still following the same testing approach. We've just broken it up into smaller silos. We are doing iterative testing in that sense. We are not really evolved our, our testing process. Tools have got better for sure to help in this uh, agile journey, but our core approach to testing still remains fundamentally the same, what we used to do earlier. And that is we play the puzzle, spot the difference. Automation has executed correctly, but we are still seeing defects in production. That means there's a gap. There's some gap over there. We need to uh, fill that out. The only way that we have been doing that is by this approach, spot the difference. Now, here's something again for people sitting at the back. I don't know how much you can contribute to this but you two are my champions over here. I'm gonna show you two images, two images that I'm guessing are gonna be very familiar to you as well. You have to tell me what are the number of differences in those, the number of differences, okay? You have five seconds. Hey, we do testing under time pressure, right? This is testing, okay? So here are the, uh, here are the images. Hold on, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll give you five more seconds, don't worry. But here's the first image. Observe it carefully. Are we done? Five seconds, 10 seconds? Okay. Here's the second one. Okay. How many differences? People at the back can also contribute if you have got. Uh, Good vision. How many differences? <laughs> Two? There were six. In fact, there's a seventh one, which even I can't really point out from here with my long fingers. Let's see if I can show that. Oh, yeah, there's one difference over, uh, over here as well, wherever the mouse. So there are at least seven that you have over here. And I'm sure if you get more time, you can find many more. But that is our approach to testing. Why? Do you think there's a correlation? Is that a false statement? At what point do you stop? Define optimum. Are you a consultant by any chance? That would have been my answer. I'm a consultant. If you have time, you can find all the differences. The question is, do you ever have time? Let's be real. You never have time. Okay. What we see as this approach is not about comparing two images. This is actually about testing our approach to testing. Because we have our requirements in some requirements document. We read that, we understand that, we collaborate on that. When it comes to testing, we are using our memory to compare what we see on the screen with what was the documentation. In some cases, we might open up the requirements to compare actually what is going on. But how often do we even do that? This approach to testing is what causes issues because it's very mundane. It is very tedious. You are always running against time and hence it is always going to be error prone. More so because it's not just images we are talking about, we are talking about real software products. And what happens in real software products? 
don't say they don't work. Product has context, right? It has got images, text, content is different. Uh, user experience is different. Form factors changes the user experience completely. The persona with which you are running that test, change of persona can change the way application behaves completely. You are taking one requirement document and using memory, you are trying to compare that at runtime in quick fashion across all these different form factors and hoping everything is fine. Of course, there are going to be defects in production. That context is very important when you use in testing. It is not about two static images of the Opera House. Okay. So if I give you these two images to find the differences, these are long pages. Find the differences in these. Now, this is a static content for that matter. This particular page that is used as an example. How easy or difficult is it going to be to do that? For? It's a challenge because again, you're going to rely on this type of approach, spot the difference. So it's not surprising bugs are going to escape. And here are some real examples, Southwest Airlines. Is this a problem? Is this screen a problem? What about the password? It seems to be a login screen, right? I click on login button, then I'll get the username password. Sorry? Form is not visible. That's what I'm saying. Maybe I click on login, then I will see the form. I don't know. But you could be right as well. In fact, this is what is the scenario over here. The background color of the form fields are transparent or is the same as what is there in the background. So the automated test, of course, will go past. There's nothing wrong. But to the user, how does the user know this is where I'm going to fill my username password or the email address password? They'll not be able to proceed. So it's a huge issue. The banking website, screen not loading correctly. Spotify app, rendering is broken. This is a insurance website from India. This is a smaller issue relatively, but the default text is all the way on the top of the fields. Very difficult to read, poor experience. Airline website, the headers are merged at different form factors. It's not scaling correctly. How is a user going to be able to use the product correctly? Same website on mobile web is rendering the full uh, website. It's not uh, the mobile website. It's not responsive in nature. That's a problem. How is the user going to navigate and select the right options? UPS website, again, on a tablet, the screen is completely broken. Media website, it works fine, but a small issue, right? A longer title overlaps with the actual content. Amazon website, everything is fine, but CSS is broken. Would you buy from such a website? If you see such a website, right? Now, these are real challenges. And here's the latest one. When I was booking my ticket to come uh, over here. Now, the site might have been slow to load, but you notice over here, it's saying null. The default text is null. I would be happier to see completely blank because it's taking time to load. What does null really mean? Right? And this is the example from last week. The problem is because of our approach still not being able to align with the modern ways of working, faster pace of working, we are going to miss out issues. And there has to be a better way to solve these problems. All of these examples that I show, they are not just UI issues, right? Eventually, it matters to the end user if the functionality can be used or not by that person. If your end user cannot use the product, that means your business is going to suffer. Your revenues are going to suffer. The user is going to move to a different product, alternate product, because they'll get better experience over there. So you lose more money and the users as well. It's a problem throughout. So you need to come up with a better approach. Is there a question? No? 
very good question. It all comes down to the risk of the issue of what is happening. Now, if in Southwest case, I cannot log in, it probably means the user is not going to purchase the ticket. In the Financial Times uh, media website, if the text is overlapping, who cares? It's one of the content. Tomorrow it's going to be a new content. It's not going to be a problem. Risk is a very important aspect of saying, what should I do to fix this or not? Priority, severity, absolutely spot on. Thanks for bringing that up. You have to put it in that category and say, what's going to happen? Spotify app, UI broken, fine. Who cares? Most of the people are using the free account. Amazon website, huge problem. All revenues are going to stop because of that. So risk is a very important aspect of saying, I need to prevent these issues from happening. Otherwise, I'm going to have a problem. And I, as a product, as an organization, whatever it might be. Okay. So we cannot leave our testing or we cannot treat our testing as a game of chance. If I find it, I'll do it. Otherwise, my users will report it from production. Testing in production is also a good strategy, by the way. In context, specific applications can do that testing in production, but we cannot leave that to a game of chance based on exactly what you said, priority, severity, the risk factor. Okay. So what this means is anything that the user is interacting with as your product, as your product functionality, based on the risk, you want to see if the risk of that issue is high and it has a big impact. I need to mitigate that. I cannot avoid just overlooking that aspect of testing. And we need to remove the aspect of chance. We need to stop playing puzzles while working and get better in that approach. And that is where visual testing actually comes into picture. Okay. So if visual testing is not done, you're going to get revenue loss, brand and credibility loss, and you lose your users as well. But to do visual testing, which is mostly done manually, you cannot be taking this approach because this approach is going to be tedious, error prone, and impossible to scale and repeat for every build that you need to release. And it's a blocker for CICD. Now you might think your existing automation might help in some aspects. Yes, it will. You can extend your test to do some more validations, but there's only limited what you can do in terms of the visual aspects out of it. Okay. So that's where the automation comes into picture. Now, how do you do visual test, right? You have to first create the baselines. And this is not about aptitude. This is in general visual testing, right? You have to create baselines first of the expected UI. This means any of your mocks that might be there, your designs that might be there, you could potentially create, use those as your baselines. Assuming the context is the same of those wireframes in each and every test of yours in each and every viewport size or form factor that the user is going to use our application. Otherwise you're trying to compare an apple with an orange. The only thing common between them, they are fruits. Otherwise there's nothing similar between them. So you have to do an apple to apple comparison to see if my baseline and my product actually matches. If I'm testing this on my phone versus my laptop browser, it's a completely different fruit. It's a different browser, different size, comparison baseline and the comparison needs to be different for it. So once you have taken the baselines or you have the baselines, then you have to compare. On comparing, it can be for a full page or what you see on the screen itself, or it can be snippets of the page itself, right? I don't want the full screen. I just want a specific section of my page that is important to me. You could validate that as well. The most important thing, and this is where unfortunately most of the visual testing tools will fail or make it very challenging for you is you need to keep updating your baselines because your product is going to evolve every sprint, every day or second day, it might keep evolving. How do you update your baselines for it as well? If you are managing this in a non-automated way, then it's going to be a problem. Very quickly, the solution is going to fall apart. It will not work for you. So you need an easy way to update the baselines as well. Okay. Now, when it comes to doing the actual validation, you have to take care of the false positives or negatives that come up. How is the comparison really happening? Product has context. Rarely your products will have static content in them. 
There'll be certain portions of static, but everything else is going to be personalized based on what the user is doing, right? Data might change, experience might change. And you want the comparison to happen effectively. So you cannot do pixel comparison. So how can you compare that is going to reduce your false positives, negatives, so that you get confidence in the validations? What is presented to me as differences is actually a difference, and you take decision based on that. Creation and maintenance of baselines has to be easy and straightforward. You cannot be spending a lot of time in that. You are using any tool to ease your pain, not to add more pain. So you have to think about that. The baseline creation has to be for each specific browser because browsers still control the rendering. Though they are W3C compliant, functionality will work, but rendering might still be different in each browser because they have their own rendering engine. So how do you ensure you can create and update baselines for all of them, for all of your devices as well, for different resolutions and viewport sizes. And of course, when you've done all the comparison, how is the result analysis going on? How confident can you be about the analysis of that data and take decisions based on that? A big challenge of our existing automation is also that we write tests for very specific functionality. I've written a login test, but there was something else broken on the screen. That is not in scope of your test, don't worry about it. How many times have we heard that? But there's a problem right over there. But because you are implementing automation in a very tightly scripted, tightly coupled fashion, you cannot look beyond the view of what that test intent is for multiple reasons that is covered as part of another test or the test execution time is going to go up because now you're doing many more things as part of the same test and many other reasons. Also, you need to think about the dynamic data that is there, whether your application is there on web, native apps, a mobile web, any of those form factors or uh, uh, types of applications as well. You need to have a solution for those. So all of our automation, uh, is needs to cater to how the product is going to evolve based on the new features, functionality, personalization that is there. Uh, and you need to keep updating your automation based on that. Pixel comparison doesn't work in such cases, right? Because it's highly dynamic data. It's always going to give you uh, wrong results. So then what can be done? That is where AI can help you, okay? This is where AI can actually help in the functional and visual testing side of things. Now, if I show you an example of the earlier test that we spoke about, and for whatever reason, this has gone back to extended mode. I'll show it like this, okay. This is a simple Selenium Java test. I'm using Selenium to do the navigations and interactions with the browser, whichever browser that might be. But whenever I want to do validations, is my screen working as expected? I'm telling Apply Tools, do the validation for me. So when I go to a particular URL, do a check window, it's going to validate the whole screen for me based on the AI algorithm that I have chosen. That is going to tell me if everything is fine or not. This is going to tell me from a functional and a visual perspective. And we'll see shortly in examples what that means as well. Likewise, you continue with your scenario implementation and you can do as many validations as you need. Now, what this does for me, right? The first time I run the test, this is where I'm going to switch back over here. I'm going to filter based on new results. This is the Apply Tools dashboard. The first time I run the test, the status is new. I'm taking any random example here. It doesn't matter what example I take. But because this is the first time I'm running the test, Apply Tools automatically can save this image as a baseline for you. So you don't have to create baselines on your own. First time you run the test, it can automatically save. Now that could be a problem. What if there's a problem in this first screen itself? Which is a very valid question that you might have already in your mind, right? What if there's an existing problem? So in that case, the default behavior can be changed to say, if there's a new test, do not save it as a baseline. In that case, it will show up as 
instead of green, it shows up as amber color or orange color. I've never been able to get that color right. But it is unresolved. There's a difference that is found. So you manually come in. It's the same screen, just the color is going to be different to indicate it is not passed. You come in and you inspect it manually the first time. You give it the go ahead and say by doing a thumbs up and say, yes, this screen is good. This is how it should be. First time you do a manual inspection. And then when you save it as a baseline, the second time when you run the test, it's going to compare it with what you had saved. Okay. So either you save it automatically or you manually approve it as a baseline. Once you have saved the baseline and you run the test, you'll be able to do the comparison automatically. So it's a very long answer to your question, but that uh, approach is very important to uh, get right. Okay. And this could have been instead of check window, I could have mentioned over here eyes dot check some name on load. So look at that GitHub Copilot is actually making it very easy for me. It's writing the code. And I could say Windows fully. That means I want to do a full window validation, but I also want to use a layout algorithm. We'll talk about the different AI algorithms. And I can actually script my implementation to do validations using a combination of algorithms that is best suited in context of this test. So I can get very specific about what type of validations to do. Now, if we come back to the dashboard over here, I'll find another example. Yeah, please. No, you could directly do it uh, as well. I'll tell you, uh, I'll show you an example of that right now. Okay. So let's start with a passing test. In this case, it has not done a full screen validation. It's just what is seen in the viewport, right? In the browser viewport as on my screen. It's not scrolling. It's not doing a full page validation because I have not instructed it to do that. Just what is seen on the screen, I want to validate. Left side is a baseline. Right side is a screenshot that was captured. You don't need any tool and right at the back, you can figure out that these two images are different. Right, Roman? Different images. You don't need any tool for that. But Happy Tools is saying this is passed because this is green. Why is that happening? That is because of the AI algorithm used. In this case, it's a layout algorithm. If I don't have control over the data, I'm using a layout algorithm which says I don't care about data as long as the structure of my pages is the same. Is the structure same uh, as the baseline? In this case, data is completely different, but structure is the same. Using layout algorithm, it is passed. If data is important to me, I control the data. I have control of the data because it's a test environment or I can seed the data that is required for my test. Then I would actually want to use a strict algorithm. This is a very powerful algorithm which says anything that is different to the human eyes, Show that as a difference to me. If I toggle between the baseline and the screenshot, anything that appears different is highlighted in pink over here. Yeah. Correct. You have to control your automation to say, I'm on the first image and this is what the image needs to be. I'm going to pause that carousal that auto spinning or change that is happening. I'll take a validation. I'll move to the next image. I'll take a validation again. The automation needs to control. AI cannot control that because that is your application behavior. Right? If you don't care what comes up inside that, you can, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Okay. So in this case, using the strict algorithm, anything that is different to the human eyes is highlighted over here. You will notice the header, uh, the logo that is not highlighted. Only the dynamic content is highlighted. If you do this as a pixel comparison, you see the whole screen is highlighted, including the headers and logos and everything. Why? Because even a single pixel shift is going to result in a difference reported with this algorithm. 
Now, does it even matter for the header or the logo if one pixel difference is there? In most cases, no. I'm saying most because it's dependent on the application, right? If that is not important, this is giving you a false positive. Anyway, dynamic content is going to give you false positives with pixel comparison. So what you can do in this case though, is you can start using a combination of algorithms. This data is not in my control. Let me mark it as a layout. When I mark it as a layout, I see the pink region has uh, gone away from that region. Then the header, I don't care about pixel comparison. I know the header is static. I'm going to mark that as a strict algorithm. Now my headers, uh, the pink region from the header has also gone away. Maybe there are ads that show up or the image carousals that are there. I don't care about it. Ads is actually a very good example, right? Because you can never predict what ad is going to show up if it shows up or not as well. So you could very well just simply ignore it. I don't care about this comparison. So now on this particular page, if your logo is a very important asset, you want that to be pixel perfect. You have used exact for that. For dynamic content, you have used layout. For static content, you have used trick. For ad type of issues, you have ignored them. Using a combination of this algorithm, you are getting the best possible validation. Now what I did from the browser over here, same thing can be done as you're implementing the test from your code as well. Same thing can be coded over here because when you're implementing, you know which locators or which elements, which divs have different type of content and you can code it accordingly over here to say these combination of algorithms is to be used to validate the particular screen that is there right now. As an implementer, you would know that, right? And in many cases, this is a journey that you go through till you get to an approved baseline using the right combination of algorithms because initially you would also be new to the tool. So you would use a combination of algorithms accordingly. But when you do it in this fashion, programmatically, then you don't have to worry about scaling or anything because any browser, any viewport size that you run with, AppliTools will automatically do the matching of those algorithms for you. You don't have to go in a different viewport size and match it in a different way. That becomes very valuable instead of doing it from the UI. Okay. I'll show another quick example over here. Before we move to the next part, what we, sh uh, what I showed was about a dynamic website, but a media website, right? Here's a native application, finance application. Data again is not in your control. So you could say that, okay, I want to mark this region as layout because I don't control the data that comes up and the pink region has disappeared, but it's not completely disappeared. You see, there's something still uh, highlighted over here inside that layout region. And if you zoom in, you will notice that there's some content that is missing inside one of those labels. That is the value of AI. It is able to distinguish between dynamic content versus a change of structure. Data missing is a change of structure. It is able to distinguish that compared to all the other dynamic data that is. Okay, so that's a combination of algorithms that can be very valuable. So coming back to where we were. This example is a very good example of not just visual testing, but functional testing as well. My test in this case could just be going through a series of navigation as a scenario. I do this action, I log in, I come to this page, I click on this profile, I do something else but all the validation is automatically happening functional and visual as part of that one validation itself. You don't have to write 10 different tests to validate the same screen or different portions of the same screen. With one call, you can get more. So it's not just scaling the execution, but you are also optimizing on the implementation side, fewer tests, which is giving you wider reach as well. That is very valuable. Okay. We spoke about the ultra fast grid, about the scaling aspect. How does that happen? So if I find over here somewhere, here's a simple way of, I'm just going to delete of these additional browsers that I had. In your configuration, when you instantiate AppliTools, 
we are simply telling what viewport size, what browsers you want to do the validations on. And then when you run the test, you just say eyes.check window, automatically it will be compared on all these different browsers or devices that you have specified. So you don't have to run the test n number of times, just change the configuration slightly. So scaling happens automatically. For the execution cloud, it's even simpler. We are used to uh, creating a new Chrome driver, new Firefox driver, right? Or new remote web driver if you want to run on some other uh, Selenium grid. So you could configurize, create driver. All you need to do is create a new remote web driver pointing to the AppTools execution cloud. That's the only change. So your test remains the same. You are making the test simpler by removing a lot of validations and replacing it with a visual validation. In your configuration, you are simply adding the ultra fast grid configurations. Yes. Five. Okay. the content of the notification. Okay. So the layout, you'll do three validations in this case, right? First validation is going to be when you see the five notifications, you click on using whatever tool you click on more, you'll see eight. That's the second validation after you click on see more. When you click on see less, you see only three. That's the third validation. Now, Using the layout algorithm, it's looking at the structure, not the content. If you use a strict validation for each of these screens, if the content changes, you'll know the notification content has changed. If you have control over that data, then use strict. If you don't have control over that data, what comes in the notifications, use layout, but it will at least check there should have been eight over here. Is that structure correct? There should have been five here. Is that structure correct? Okay. the algorithm takes care of that. You just have to use the algorithm the right way. You just have to say on my screen, there are notifications on the top left corner, for example, right? Browser notifications come on the top right corner. That region, I want to use a layout comparison. Rest of the screen could be strict, right? Or on our app, when you do a swipe down, in Android, at least it's swipe down, right? Pull down, you will see the notifications over there. So you do that pull down, then do a validation using layout. You'll see how many notifications are there. Okay. Yeah. So that's your functional validation, right? You could have a test. And this is where, again, optimization of your tests also come into picture. If there's a form, as you said, login is a good example, right? Username, password is mandatory before you log in. But the save password is an optional field. So your scenario could be without entering any credentials you try to log in, you see two error messages. You're still on the same screen. Then you enter username, don't enter password. You see the second error message, first one goes away. The third one is about you flip that. Username is not there, only password is there. You see error only on the second one, that combination, right? And then you actually enter both the data, but invalid data. That's the fourth combination. Then you give valid combination uh, credentials and you uh, proceed, you're able to get onto the home page now. So you've done N number of combinations on that same journey to do the full validation. In this case, you will also be able to check save password is checked or not. So you could flip that uh, value as well between all those, uh, those tests. You'll be able to uh, do the validations accordingly. So your test determines what are you trying to validate, mandatory, non-mandatory. No tool can tell you about that. You as an application owner or a team member on that application only can tell that. So you have to design your flows accordingly. This has to be end to end, right? Because it's at the top. The UI component is going to be, I don't care if I have logged in or not. I've set the cookies, whatever. 
I'm just loading my home page directly, assuming this user Anand has logged in. Or I go to step five of my workflow directly without doing one, two, three, four, by setting the correct stubs, mocks that might be in place, I directly check the components on screen number five or step number five. That will take care of. And over there also, you can use visual validation because you're doing UI component validation, right? You'll get fast feedback on that as well. So what this means is uh, we've seen, I'll get back over here. So with visual AI, you can do the functional and visual validation. We spoke a little bit about the visual AI algorithms itself, strict layout and so on, ignore and the ultra fast cloud. The important thing is this approach simplifies your testing tremendously. You still use your existing tools for automation. But the validations you delegate to Apply Tools in this particular case, where you get functional and visual validations using AI. You as a team member now just need to see when I run these tests in my CI or locally, if there is a difference reported, then I go to the Apply Tools dashboard and I take a decision what is right or wrong. Because a tool cannot tell you if something is wrong. It could be your product has evolved, it's a regression found, your test is wrong or flaky in implementation, reasons could be plenty. No tool can tell you if the end behavior is right or wrong. Right only in the case of everything has passed. There's no difference found. Okay. Uh, so simplifies the implementation. Implementation is faster. You get added coverage as part of it. It works with dynamic content as well, which helps you focus on things that actually matter to you, to the application. And it works with shifting content as well. So if it's a long page, some portion of the page has changed which causes dramatic shift in the rest of the page, you again will get false positives. So dynamic content also, uh, it can work fine. Okay. Uh, likewise, we saw from a scaling perspective, how uh, the ultra fast grid, simply by providing browser device configurations can automatically scale uh, the test for you. And you can get feedback on that. So instead of results from one test, I'm getting results from all your different browsers and applications as part of the same execution cycle. So you run the test once in your CI, you get feedback from all your different browsers and devices automatically. And that also is very powerful. And that is done by simple configuration change by providing different browsers and devices. And the execution cloud will help you self heal while running in the ultra fast grid. So your tests now become more stable. You don't have to worry about locator changes. And at the same time, even though locators have changed, you can be rest assured your user experience is not changing as a result of that. Now, important thing about the execution cloud, it is not that it is just running in isolation, right? Uh, in the cloud and you don't see any feedback for it. What you could also do is, I think it's gonna be better if I stop this. Share again. Yeah, go on. Sign in. So the first time the test runs in the execution cloud, when that screen is captured, Apply Tools has information about that screen and all possible locators for that screen and different options for that based on whatever algorithm is there. Next time when the test is trying to interact with a particular locator, if it does not find it, Apply Tools automatically will try to find out is there any other locator for that particular screen. But the first time the test needs to have passed. No, it's not that way. It's about is there a different matching uh, locator for that same element? It's not login versus sign in. It's not looking at semantics. Uh, that is not possible. It does not even make sense. But is there any other way to find out that same locator? Instead of text is login, is there an ID? Is there a CSS? Is there a class name? Is there something else that can be used to identify the same locator? Apply tools automatically will capture that. Yes, correct. Apply tools are automatically will capture that. 
Okay. Now, when you run this in the execution cloud, you can also download that video of the execution, get the console logs and so on as well. So it's not that you're just running blind that it has run somewhere, it is reporting pass or fail and you have no insight into it. You can still download those artifacts and see what really is going on with it as well. Mm -hmm. No, so this is a good example of that, right? The test is marked as unresolved over here in this case. It has three screenshots, checkpoints that are captured. One of those has a difference reported. But Apply Tools doesn't know if this is because of a functional change or a visual change or which parts of your multiple algorithm combinations, what has changed over here. And it's, it is logical not to do that as well, right? Because each application could be extremely different and complex. And only you understand really as a team member what that is. So for a validation, whether it is for a snippet or for the full page, all the differences are reported as one difference found over here. You will come to this screen and Aptitudes uh, identifies what are the differences over here. You will go through all of those differences and say, ah, this is a, a visual difference. This is a test issue. This is an application issue. There could be n number of issues on that one screen itself. The beauty is you're getting all those differences highlighted in one validation itself. You're not missing out. You don't have to play spot the difference to see where, what difference might be there and what is the reason for that. You have all the needles found from that haystack for you. You just have to take a decision on those, what to do with them. And if you think this is how it is going to be going forward, you just do a thumbs up. When you do a thumbs up, automatically, Apply Tools, not automatically, there's one more step. Now this test is marked as passed. You will click on save. That is going to update the baseline. So the next time after you update the baseline, it is expecting the new behavior. But if you say, this is a defect, this is a defect. I'm not going to do a thumbs up. Instead, let me report this as a defect. So if there's an integration done with your defect management tool, automatically a defect is created at this point. You are saying thumbs down. Now I'm failing the test. As a team member, you know what to decide, do with that. Because only you can understand what is expected out of it. <laughs> only what you change is going to be uh, updated as a baseline. So there could be, uh, let's take some other example. So in this case, there are two tests which have some difference. Let's assume there are different differences in each case. One of them, you're going to do a thumbs up. Another one, you do a thumbs down. Only the one for which you do a thumbs up and click on the save button is going to be updated as the base thing. You can potentially do that. It's the same thing like saying, I want to take my wireframes and I want to save that as a baseline. You could do that, but it's a very tedious work because you have to match the viewport size and other combinations to make sure it's an apple to apple comparison. Instead, in that case, what would be done is product owner is saying, this is going to change. Let the test run, let it report it as a difference and identify what was expected to change. Is that exactly what has changed or not? And then do that comparison. Quick and it is going to prevent issues uh, leaking into your product, right? Because you are not verifying. Yes, product owner is saying this has changed. Fine. When you run the test, we'll validate. Is that exactly what has changed? Exactly. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there are different ways how you could do that. Uh, one. Okay. Let's, let's expand on. No, it's a very important question. I'll tell you different ways how uh, you could potentially do this. And this is where it's very important to separate from the tool. 
and think about the concept, right? What I'm going to tell you is conceptually what uh, is important. So integration with a tool is easy, easy or difficult based on whichever tool you use. You need to have a strategy how to approach this. So in your case, if you are saying different environments have got different versions of your application, what does that really mean? Another aspect of that, another complexity in that is in your QA environment, you have a different version, but there are multiple different feature branches that the developers are working, which is going to introduce more changes as well. How do you manage that also? Okay. All that means is you need a unique way to identify a baseline in order to do the comparison. Because the baselines essentially are different for the different environments. If you just take a conceptual look at it, okay? Because you cannot compare what is there in QA with prod, for example, right? Uh, it's a different thing. Now, the way Apply Tools does this, to identify a baseline, there are it's a combination of five different parameters. One is the name of the application. Second is name of the test. Third is the browser. Viewport size and the operating system. A unique combination of these five parameters helps AppTools identify a baseline. If I run the same test on Chrome versus Firefox, it's a different baseline. If I run the same test on Chrome full screen versus Chrome uh, smaller screen size, different baseline because any one parameter has changed. Okay, That is one part how the baseline is identified. Now, AppliTools also has support for branches. You can create branches for baselines as well. So what that means is I could say, I have a feature branch. I'm going to create a branch in AppliTools baselines as well. Any work that is happening in that feature branch, I will run the tests on that. For that branch, I will see the results. I will save the baselines for that feature branch. But when that feature branch is getting merged into master, I want to merge my baselines from feature branch into master as well. Because otherwise, what's going to happen? The minute my code is merged into master, my tests are going to fail because baselines are different. So I can merge my baselines as well. Okay. Now with this approach, you could now create a strategy. And uh, we've got an expert if that is something uh, Ranjit is here, uh, who works day in and day out on this aspect. He can guide better on this aspect. But it's all about strategy. How do you want to manage your baselines? Eventually, your QA environment is going to go to prod. So you want to move that also forward, right? QA environment is not going to remain QA forever. Prod is not going to remain like that forever. So it's all a matter of strategy, how you can use a combination of these parameters with the baseline version support to achieve what you need. Absolutely. It looks at the website. So when you run the test, it needs a first successful run for applicants to be able to capture the DOM information and the different set of locators for that particular page. Based on what it has captured next time when the test is trying to run, because it is running on Tools infrastructure, you say uh, driver.find element, that element is not there anymore, right? Uh, the locator has changed. So Tools will find out, is there a different locator that could be used to find the same element? And then it will use that. So it's not looking at your tests. It is based on the source of your application. It is going to be able to find that. That's the magic wand over here, right? That's why I told you, come and sit in front. <laughs> so the magic wand actually tells that, right? That this has been uh, run using self-healing. And this is a good example of saying that, yes, all these tests, ran using self-healing, but two tests still had failures. And these failures could have been because the locator could not be found, for example, right? I tried to self-heal, but I didn't find another matching locator. And it could have failed at that point as well. Or it could be a different issue. Like in this case, this seems like a uh, visual issue based on that. This is not a self-healing based, a locator based thing. Correct. 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 
So that's why this magic wand will tell you that this has passed using self-healing. Now, is this what is expected for you or not? Yes. Absolute. No. No. Then in that case, you don't want self-healing, right? So as a strategy, you need to say, do I want self-healing or not? Ideally, I would be in that same thought process. I don't want self-healing because I don't trust locator changes. Why has it changed? There should be a requirement based on which it has changed. It cannot be on a whim and fancy of anyone or by mistake anyone changing it, right? There has to be a reason why it has changed. As a tester, I want to know that reason. Only then I can say, yes, the end behavior is correct. But to the tester, does a locator really matter? What matters is the functionality. The look and feel should not change. How does the locator changing or not matter to the user? User doesn't care about the locators. User cares about functionality and experience. Name is different. That is a display text. That anyway visual will uh, report that the uh, label has changed. Sign in has changed to login. That anyway visual will change. Uh, tell you that that it's error. But can you click on that button with self healing? You will be able to click and proceed. So it's a soft assertion in a way, right? You're able to click and proceed, but visually you're still getting it as an error that the label has changed. That's where a combination of self healing with visual is a safety for me. Self healing in isolation is a big risk to me. All comes down to strategy eventually, right? What is important, what is in your control or not, it all depends on you. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, configurable. It is configurable. It's an internal implementation, even I'm not aware of. You give Ranjit a couple of whiskeys, maybe he'll tell you something. I don't know. Whiskeys, right? No, sorry, that's the internal implementation. Even I'm not aware of it. But the concept is right now it used a different locator. When you run it again, it might use a third locator for that matter. And it shouldn't matter to you as a tester who's running the test as long as functionality is working fine and user experience is not broken. That is what matters as a tester. Any other question? For the native app, we do have a native mobile grid uh, for Android as well as iOS, but uh, that works for specific tech stacks of uh, the frameworks that are there for Android and iOS. It's not yet there for all the different frameworks that is there. But ultra fast grid will work for web and mobile. Web. It's about scaling. It's about cross browser testing, right? Typically, we get uh, so the question is what is the main purpose of the ultra fast grid? Is it just to run against? Uh, prevent execution against multiple browsers. It's about scaling, right? At very fast speed. So the example I said, 100 tests, one hour on one browser. The most important browsers for you would be Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge. If your application is responsive, there are three typical breakpoints, full browser, tablet, and uh, the phone. You could also think about it as portrait and landscape mode. So that makes it five combinations, right? Four browsers and yeah four and four, eight combinations in that sense, if you look at it. If you have to run the same 100 tests eight times, that is 800 tests. The test data requirements, data, uh, infrastructure setup and all required for it. It's a huge pain. It takes a long time to execute and get the results back. With the ultra fast grid, you run the test just once. So in 100 tests in one hour, but to get results from all these additional uh, browsers, maybe five or 10 minutes more. So one hour, 10 minutes instead of eight hours of overall execution time. That's the difference. And that is based on the premise. Again, I am highlighting that, right? Assuming you have no browser specific components. There might be cases where you say out of 100 tests, two tests, I want to make sure I run on each and every browser and device just to make sure everything is fine. As a tester, I probably would feel more comfortable with that approach, right? At least my, I've verified 
my most important P0 scenarios are working fine in all the different browsers and devices. But the rest of 98, I'm going to use the ultra fast grid, scale it up, run it very quickly and get the feedback. Again, it comes down to the strategy, the risk aspect, priority, severity. You have to consider it based on that. It is way faster and I ran the test to show that as well, right? It took the same time to get seven results as for one test. It took almost the same time. I launched the browser, ran the test on local. I ran it in the execution cloud with seven browsers and I got the data back in the same time. So I don't need to compare with anything else to say this is fast. But it's logical that this is going to be way faster because I'm not running the same test seven times. I don't have to launch seven browsers. I don't have to enter uh, login details for each of them. I don't need test data for seven different browsers because maybe your application doesn't support the same user logging in from multiple devices or multiple browsers. What are you going to do in that case? Right? So though any other cloud uh, solution browser cloud solutions. I've been around for a long time, but that's the approach that we have. Or you set up a Selenium grid where you manage your own thing. You have to set up the browsers, correct versions. It takes time to launch the browser. Your test environment needs to be able to take that kind of load as well. 100 tests versus 800 tests hitting your test environment. You are talking about parallel, right? It's going to need more beefier test environment for that matter to support that kind of load. So it's a different problem you start solving in that case. And the value is still not as enough as what you need. Yeah. So the important thing here is about thinking about the solution. What is going to make it optimal, right? What is be, uh, going to be efficient? You choose a solution based on that. I showcased Apply Tools. There might be other solutions which do something similar or in a better way. If you come across, please let me know. It's a good learning. Okay. I don't like to talk about any other tool, good or bad. Uh, it's not my place. I think that's not a good approach. I know this approach scales very well. It is very effective. And there are a lot of customers using it to see value. You can also sign up for a free account and try it out. Take it for a spin and we'll uh, help you in that. Once you experiment, you yourself will figure out what is it. Sorry, one minute. There was a question. So it's very simple if you think about it conceptually, right? I spoke about Netflix. You download a video, you play it back in airplane mode. If, um, how do I put this politely? I have seen times in the browser, I'll take it on myself, where you used to be able to save web pages and load it in the offline mode. File, save as. I don't think any one of us saves web pages anymore to disk, right? But that was our approach. Why did we do that? Because if I am not connected to the application, I can still launch the application directly. I'm saving everything regarding that web page on my local disk. Same approach is done here. When you say eyes.check window, Apply Tools SDK will capture all the DOM and CSS, send it to the grid, where the only time that is potentially taken is to launch the browser. But once you launch it, you are loading a saved page from disk. You're not hitting your application back. So there's no network latency there. There's no functional navigation interaction happening. You're simply loading a page and doing the validation. That's what makes it really fast. And that's the technology in very high level terms that goes behind the scene. In fact, I have a slide for that, which I might have skipped. So this is what it is, right? You have, where is my mouse? So when your test is running on local, on your machine or in your CI, using any automation tool with Apply Tools integrated. You say eyes.check window, it will capture the HTML and the CSS. Send it to the ultra fast grid. Based on your configuration that you specified, the same page is going to be opened up in all of these different browsers and devices as a static page. Once the page is open, then you do a visual validation. So that makes it tremendously fast. There's no network latency, no network calls happening behind the scene, nothing. 
everything that is required is available in that uh, information that is sent across. Any other question? You still need to download what? Nugget package for what? You are going to run the test only on one. So assume you're using ultra fast grid on local. You're not using the execution cloud. You will run the test on any one browser of your choice, which is your primary browser. You will have the driver for that and you'll use that. Are you using Selenium by the way? Okay. C sharp. Okay. So Selenium 3 or Selenium 4? See, if you move to Selenium 4, it has Selenium Manager as a new functionality, which will manage the browser drivers automatically for you. So you don't need to download any browser drivers or manage that manually at all. Okay. Any one browser of your choice, your primary browser, you are going to run the test only on that. And you provide the configuration for all the other browsers that you need. And that is going to happen on the aptitudes grid. You don't need the drivers for that. With the execution cloud, you don't even need the driver in that sense because it's going to run in Apply Tools, execution cloud. You don't need the driver. Yeah. It's mostly for locators because when you interact with an element, if that locator has changed, you get an element not found exception. It could be to retrieve content or to do interactions with your application. What is there on the screen, it is going to self-heal based on that. It will not do a refresh or anything for you. Though there are different capabilities within the SDK, but again, that's or specific advanced capabilities, but I would not even suggest that as an answer to your question. But intermittent failures is a very different conversation again. There's no such thing like an intermittent failure. It's a failure. Okay. Any other question? So I hope I've been able to showcase the concept and one of the solutions for that, right? about how, first of all, why is visual validation important? How it can ease the pain. You don't have to manually go through all of your screens and look for each and every uh, piece of information on the screens to see what is happening with your application. With the ultra fast grid, you are, with visual AI, you are able to see all of that information automatically. Anything that is different, you'll be able to see that. With the ultra fast grid, you don't even have to worry about seeing your application in each and every different browser, device, form factor. Automatically, you will get that kind of feed. And because the test runs in one browser correctly, you can assume it is going to run in all the other browsers as well. And visually, you are validating if your functionality is working correctly, your user experience is correct in all the other browsers and devices as a result. With self-healing, if you are into situations where your locators change frequently, you will be able to get a lot of value from the execution cloud where you don't even have to manage your single browser as well on your machine or your infrastructure. Because when your test is running on the machine, your machine is essentially useless. You cannot do anything with the machine, right? So delegate to the execution cloud, let it run over there. You're free to use your machine to do whatever else is required at that time. It uh, frees you up much more. So that can give you a lot of uh, value. Okay. I think. That's what I really had. Uh, here's some data actually uh, what we have seen from the field, right? With Visual AI, you are able to, uh, teams are able to implement the test almost six times faster because a lot of time in implementation goes in writing the assertions. You don't have to do that. You are just doing the functional implementation and doing visual validation at the correct points in time. The tests are more stable almost four times because again, less dependence on locators, automatically stability is going to increase. Less code means less defects in product code as well as test code, right? Less code for validations, less locators, the tests are going to be more stable as well. Uh, the AI algorithms are 
very powerful, very accurate. 99.49% accurate based on more than 2 billion tests that I've run on the platform so far. So it's very reliable, but the test results depend on your choice of algorithms. You understand your application. You are scripting the implementation. You need to choose the algorithms in the right combination based on QA versus prod or static versus dynamic data. Based on your choice, the results are going to be 99.9% .9 accurate based on whatever you have asked aptitudes to validate. And with the ultra fast grid, this is not using execution cloud, just the ultra fast grid, you can save at least 18 times faster test results. 18 times compared to regular cross browser test. That is huge value. Okay. So what that means, we started with the pyramid, let's end with the pyramid. It is very important to add user experience validation to your automation strategy based on risk. It is all based on context, what is important to you or not. If user experience is an impact to you, if not working correctly, it's going to be a problem. Then you better find ways how you can integrate UX validation as part of your automation because manually you will never be able to scale. Uh, and the combined effort of all types of automation and exploratory testing is what is going to tell you the quality of your product. So if anyone tells or asks you, especially the testers, what is the test execution report? I hope you are also asking, have you also seen the results of API automation and unit testing and performance and security as well? Or are you asking just as functional testers about it? It's very important because all aspects of automation, all aspects of testing tell you the quality. Combined results tell you the quality of your product. And that is very important to keep in mind. Okay. So I have a holistic quality strategy. I'm not calling it a visual strategy, a quality strategy. Shift left to get quick feedback. That's the only way you'll be able to scale. And visual testing uh, needs to be part of the strategy for sure. AI will add power to your functional automation. Less code, greater coverage, stable code, which means also less defects in production. Ultra-fast grid plus ultra-fast uh, visual AI plus ultra-fast cloud will give you AI power for cross-browser testing. And that can give you a lot of value as well. It needs less test data, less load on environments, and less flakiness. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. Take a sip of water. If there are any other questions or thoughts, happy to discuss that more. Yes, please. Thank you. KB range. No. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely.
absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Each and every test, and it doesn't matter who's thinking of these tests, developer, product owner, tester, automation engineer, estet, any title that you can think of, doesn't matter. Any test that is thought of is important to be validated. If it needs to be repeated more than a couple of times, it is important to be automated. What I always do, and I coach teams, uh, team members on that, you take any test that is important for automation and start by thinking, can it be automated at the unit test length? You start at the bottom and then you say, with collaboration if required with other roles, no, this test cannot be automated as a unit test because it's not testing a particular function or a particular uh, scope of a class or object that is there, right? It needs to be a level up. That level up, is that a contract test? Is that an API component test or a UI component test? Because I still want to work as close to the code as possible, right? I don't want to deploy. As lower in the pyramid I can go, I'll go to the lowest level. If it cannot be automated there, I'm going to go one level up. If the intent of that test still cannot be validated with that level, then I'm going to go one level up. The last level or the second last level is my UI end-to-end -end test. After going through all these different levels of the pyramid that we have here. From bottom up, if I'm not able to automate at the lower layer, then I'm moving up progressively. The last second last stages, I need to automate this at the UI level end to end scenario. Worst situation, the last possible thing, this cannot be automated, not worthy of automation. I want to regress this manually at every defined time. So yes, I completely agree. We don't want to start automation at the top, start from the lower ends because that is going to be faster, quicker to identify and uh, fix as required. The second aspect of what you said, you start losing focus. And that's again, a matter of team strategy, right? Who is going to be doing what? Ideally, there's no, I would not like to have defined roles, tester, rest, developer, product owner. One person can actually do everything. Do we have the time? Do we have all the necessary skills to do all aspects of that SDLC? No. And of course, it will take forever to build the end product, right? That's where we have larger teams and then we have got specializations in them. So you need to think about as a product strategy, complete development strategy rather. Do we need specialized roles to do different parts of these layers of the pyramid who can focus and collaborate starting from bottom up then uh, automate those scenarios. So you definitely don't want to dilute your value proposition or start thinking about one type of test, ignore the others. Maybe if you are in that stage, it probably means you don't have enough specialists to focus at each layer to make progress at the same time. It potentially could be that reason as well. Does that... Very true. I've worked in many such cases, but many a times that also becomes an excuse for the development teams. This is legacy code. We cannot touch it. The people who implemented it are no longer here. I don't know if I change this, if something else will break and you yourself will say, no, please don't touch that. Right. It's a risk. And sometimes it's used as an excuse as well. And I'm saying sometimes because it's all contextual in uh, specific cases, right? Eventually you have to bite the bullet and say, I need to change this legacy monolith into something more manageable. And how do I do that? There are different strategies. If this is an old piece of code, there's no documentation or I don't know who and how it was built. Let me write tests on top of that to sort of understand and automate its functionality. Then as I start making changes, these tests will sort of give me the feedback for it. There are different ways to approach it. No one way will guarantee you zero problems. But you have to make progress at some point around that. But 
teams have used that as an excuse. This is legacy code. We just have to focus on the top layer. And that is a mess because you end up writing so many tests on the top. It doesn't give you any value in the end anyway. The tests are flaky. They don't run fast enough. And you still need to rely on manual exploratory testing. And many times teams are saying that we run uh, tests over the weekend because it runs for 24 hours, 30 hours, and so on, right? Or we run nightly tests because it takes eight hours to run. Developers have made hundreds of changes in that day. What are those tests going to tell you? Are those tests even updated with the new functionality for it to tell you feedback on what changes have happened? It's a huge problem, and somehow that needs to break. So again, comes down to the point of less tests at the top, which is important. And that less could be, I have worked with some teams which had just one end-to-end -end scenario at the top. Everything else was API and unit tests at the layer, lower layers. And they had massive test coverage, no issues. But it depends on the application and the maturity of the team as well who's making the changes. So it's all contextual. So the end-to-end -end test needs to be that business value. Yeah. That's in fact, what is there in the fine print over there, right? The right-hand side to, uh, for the left pyramid, the two uh, square brackets. On the top of those, so let's see if I can highlight it here. I can, so this one, right? This is business facing test. These are your UI or API workflow tests. They focus on the business value. The requirements, am I really meeting those requirements or not as a user? The lower layers, contract, API, component, unit tests, these are all technology facing. To implement that functionality, what changes do I need to do? That is not testing or validating your business functionality. That is validating your technical implementation around, your technical uh, your implementation logic. It works very well. Yeah. There are so many different ways to address that. Any other thoughts, questions? Zapped? Drained out? Need another drink? <laughs> yeah. Well, if not, thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope um, it was interesting enough and you got some different ideas around visual and cross browser testing. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Yeah, feel free to hang around for a bit longer, socialize.